Hello, I'm Paul Evans and welcome to Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain. This edition has been funded by a grant from the Scottish Government and in it I'll be looking at two approaches to pain management that span nearly 3,000 years of civilization. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could combine Western healthcare with these techniques from Eastern religions effectively, but to bring it in in a secular setting. Now, fast forward from 600 years BC, right up to the frontiers of science. I just tell them, look, this is green, these are these three bars. They're either green or red. Just try to make them all green. The idea of being able to control something using brainwaves was like science fiction to me. Well, science fiction or ancient religion, what these two techniques have in common is that they both aim to tap into the power of the mind to help manage pain. Mindfulness has its roots in Buddhist meditation, although it's not inherently religious and is often taught independent of religion. Since the 1970s, its principles have been embraced by clinical psychologists for the management of stress, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, addiction and chronic pain. Vidya Malabirch sustained a severe spinal injury when she was 16. She's founder and director of Breathworks, an organisation which offers training for health professionals and individuals in mindfulness-based approaches to chronic pain and chronic illness. So what is mindfulness? The pat answer uh, that's widely used within research is moment by moment non-judgmental awareness. But I don't find that very evocative myself. I don't understand it. Either. Yes, yes. So really it's about being present, being awake to what you're experiencing right now, physically, mentally and emotionally. And on the basis of being awake and aware, you can make choices as to how you respond to that experience. I don't know what you mean by being aware. Of course I'm aware. I'm awake, my eyes are open, I'm talking to you and we're smiling at each other. I'm aware. Isn't that what you mean? It's what I mean broadly, but you'd be surprised at how unaware we are a lot of the time. We're on what's called autopilot. So we're going through the day just with all our habits about how we do things. And if you've got, say, back pain, you might have all kinds of habits in terms of the way you respond mentally and emotionally in particular to that back pain. Well, also physically, it might be you've got back pain and you think, oh, my back hurts, I'll stay in bed. And you don't really realise that you can as it were, sort of step back from being completely identified with the experience of back pain, step back and be a person who's aware that they have back pain and that they can choose what they do with that back pain. That's obvious on the, on the physical level, but mentally and emotionally, mindfulness means that you're aware of your thoughts and your emotional states as they happen. You're not completely identified with your thoughts and your emotional states. And uh, you'll be surprised at how difficult that is. That most of us, if I say to you, what are you thinking, what are you thinking, what are you thinking, you probably have to pause and think, oh, well, I'm not really sure what I'm thinking. My immediate answer would be, well, I'm thinking about what I'm thinking. And what am I thinking? Well, I'm thinking about how to answer this question. Well, I'm not thinking. Yeah. So being aware of one's thoughts would be you're washing up, your back's hurting. And it's as, as if you can't kind of come to wake up to being in the middle of that experience, washing up with your back hurting, and you can, th you can be aware, my back's hurting, I'm holding my breath, <sighs> I can relax my breath, and I'm having thoughts that are very fear-based, thoughts about, oh my God, how am I gonna get through the evening? How am I gonna cope with my kids coming home? How am I gonna cope with doing the housework? I won't be able to sleep, I'm gonna get to totally stressed out, my life's ruined. And those are the kind of thought processes that many of us have on a very unconscious, habitual level, and then they start to drive our behaviour to become a person who gets more and more wound up, perhaps very irritable, argumentative, and so on. And with mindfulness, it's what's really wonderful about it is you can just think, ah, oh, I'm irritable. That's very different from being an irritable person. You're a person who's having some irritable thoughts, some irritable emotions. And this is where the non-judgmental component comes in because you don't think I'm irritable oh that means I'm a really bad person I shouldn't be irritable you just think oh that's interesting I'm irritable put it away put it away yeah and how can I respond right now to help that irritation reduce 
as opposed to just getting more and more and more irritable in a blind and unaware way. And I'm sure any of us know what it's like to just be completely caught up with our mental and emotional states and not have any ability to have perspective and balance around those states. Something I do, that I've learned to do, is I have pain and it changes my personality sometimes. And I can recognise now how it's changing my mood and how it's affecting other people. Mm. And I try to visualise myself by stepping outside my body and looking back at myself. And what happens when you step outside your body and look back at yourself? I see my grumpiness, my mood, and I can identify with what the other person is seeing. Yeah, I would say that the outcome is very, very similar. Because what you're doing there is you're, if you like, stopping, instead of just being Mr. Grumpy, you're stopping, you're thinking, ah, oh, I'm grumpy, it's having an effect on me, it's having an effect on other people. And you're recognising you have a choice. And you, you only recognise you have a choice by stopping and identifying what's going on. Waking, that's, when I say wake up, that's what I mean, sort of coming to from a sort of autopilot habitual, unaware way of being to thinking, oh, here I am, I'm grumpy. Wow, I'm grumpy. And I can do something about that. So it's very, very similar, but I would personally be careful of encouraging someone to step outside their body because the, the tricky thing when you've got pain is it's in your body and mindfulness helps us, to be, helps us become whole. So we're not splitting off from a part of ourselves. So Obviously it works for you, which is great, but for some people the idea of stepping outside the body would be a way of splitting off from the pain. I actually mean stepping out of my mind yes. rather than the body. Yes, yeah. so stepping out of your mind, I think that's very accurate. And sometimes it's called decentering. in fact, within, within mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. They talk about that as decentering, which means sort of decoupling one's identity from the mental states that you're having. So you have just described mindfulness. In your own experience. Well, there we are. And do, and do you find it empowering when you think, oh, I'm grumpy, I've got a choice here, it's affecting other people? I find that it stops me getting into a spiral of grumpiness and getting into an argument at home. Yeah, yeah. My wife may say to me, Paul, that's unreasonable. And I can look at myself and say, this is why this is happening. In the old days, I'd carry on and we just spiral into an argument and now I can stop and say, she's right, I can see it. It's affecting her and it's affecting me. Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's brilliant, yeah. So it, essentially, those are the kind of skills that we're teaching with mindfulness. And again, you've described very well the non-judgmental aspect in that you're able to say, I'm grumpy, and it's affecting myself and other people without saying, oh, I'm a really bad person because I'm grumpy. And because I'm a really bad person, then, you know, I'm going to get more grumpy. I think people with chronic pain and illness, quite naturally, we have poor self-esteem. We've lost our confidence. We think that we're useless, perhaps, if we've lost our job. Or say, if you didn't have this awareness that you're describing and you were just arguing with your wife day after day after day, that's deeply undermining, isn't it? It's exhausting. Yeah. It's, it's a horrible way to live. But the fact that you can say, oh yes, I'm grumpy and it's affecting her, it's affecting me and I don't have to keep doing this. But you run Breathworks and you train people to do this. Yeah, so one of the things I quite often say on our courses, and we train health professionals to run these courses, and these are highly educated people often, you know, very skilled and quite complex methodologies and so on and they can find mindfulness very affecting, very powerful. But I often say to people, this is not rocket science. And in a way, the shocking thing is that we need training to learn how to do what is actually innate when we get out of our own way and we begin to let go of all the unhelpful habits that we've learned through a lifetime of experience. You know, we, we protect ourselves in all kinds of ways. But that's what I love about mindfulness, that in a way it's innate. So we just learn to come back to something that we recognise and that we taste as true and that we can do for ourselves. So we do two different sorts of training. We run courses 
for people in pain or people with chronic health problems of any sort, as well as people who are suffering from stress, which is more like the busy, stressed person who's still in work, that kind of thing, but they're finding work difficult because of stress. Mindfulness can be really, really helpful. So we work from that end of the spectrum right through to people who are very disabled by their health. This is usually an eight week program. So you go for a two and a half hour class and then you'll have home practice. So we give people CDs of guided mindfulness practices and you'll do those every day, come back to the class, report back how you're getting on. And then we also do training of health professionals so they can take either the eight week program into their clinical setting or they can just learn about mindfulness to bring into their clinical practice in a more informal way. I think that's a good point, that this isn't some sort of airy-fairy thing that's come out of the blue. It is a recognised pain management and stress management technique. Definitely. And there's more and more research about at the moment about mindfulness. Really, it came into the West in about the 1970s in a clinic in uh, Massachusetts with a chap called John Kabat-Zinn, who was a highly trained scientist and a meditator. And he thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could combine Western healthcare with these proven techniques from Eastern religions effectively, but to bring it in in a secular setting. So he started doing that in the 70s. And then really, I think it's been about the last 10 years that it started to really take off both here in the UK and also in other countries. And there's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, sometimes called MBCT, particularly for preventing relapse into depression. So there's some big clinical trials showing that that's effective. And there's acceptance and commitment therapy, which includes mindfulness as part of its approach or methodology. And that's being used more and more within pain management. So there's more and more research being done it's still in its infancy, I would say, but there's an explosion of interest. It's sometimes called third wave psychological therapies, which are more acceptance based. And that's the very interesting paradox with mindfulness, that mindfulness won't make your pain go away. I think it's a recognition with chronic pain that we probably can't make it go away. So how can one live with the unpleasant experience? That's effectively what it is. Pain is an unpleasant sensation in the body. How can you live with that, with peace of mind, with high functioning, quality of life, positive emotional states and so on? And I think what's being recognised is mindfulness and acceptance based approaches. They may enable you to do that better than fighting your pain, being caught up in a battle with it, thinking you can get rid of it somehow or other, because you're always going to fail. That's Vidya Mala Birch. Breathworks offers mindfulness training in many different forms for those of us living with chronic pain and to train health professionals and organisations. Courses can be accessed face-to-face -face through distance learning, online or online with mentoring. Check out their website, which is breathworks-mindfulness.org.uk. That's breathworks-mindfulness.org.uk. The small print in every edition of Airing Pain is that whilst Pain Concern believes the information and opinions on Airing Pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, from ancient to modern. The Scottish Centre for Innovation in Spinal Cord Injury brings together a multidisciplinary team of engineers, scientists and clinicians. One of their research projects is being carried out at the Southern General Hospital in Glasgow, where I met lecturer in rehabilitation engineering at the University of Glasgow, Alexander Vuktovich. She was with one of her research subjects, retired teacher Andy Nisbet. What we are doing here for rehabilitation engineering, we are applying different engineering techniques to aid recovery of people after spinal cord injury, or it's applicable also in general for people after injuries to the central nervous system. So what sort of injuries are we talking about? How do they affect people? After spinal cord injury, you have some effects that you see immediately and something that developed after a time. So what you immediately see is uh, 
complete or partial loss of uh, motor function, movement and sensation, control of bladder and bowel, in some cases breathing, th body temperature control. And then there are some other things which we call secondary effects that develop some time after injury as a consequence basically like osteoporosis, muscle weakness, and one of the consequences is uh, this chronic central neuropathic pain. Could you explain what that is? It's a chronic pain that typically develops some time after an injury, and uh, it's caused by the injury to the somatosensory system, and it's generated in the brain rather than in, in body, but it's perceived as coming from the body. So, let me get this right. The injury may have healed, right. but, but the pain persists. Yes. Now, Andy, you're one of Alex's research subjects. Explain your injury to me first. Six years ago, I had a spinal cord injury at uh, T4 level. I don't remember exactly when after or in the stage of recovery that the pain sort of kicked in or when I noticed the pain. But since then, it's been constant neuropathic pain in my legs and in my left arm. And when I heard Alex was doing the research into it, I thought I'd give it a go just to see what came of it. This is a study that is uh, that has been funded by Medical Research Council. So we are trying to see if people can be trained to voluntarily modulate their brain waves and if this modulation will result in a reduction of pain. So I think it was quite a risky project because first of all, we didn't know if we will be able to define the area in the brain that is related to this sort of pain. Then we didn't know if people will be able to train themselves to modulate brain waves. And the third thing that we didn't know, even if they trained this, they managed to modulate brain waves, would it affect pain at all? So there were three things that uh, had to be <laughs> fulfilled. So how are you training people to modulate their brain waves? I just tell them, look, this is green, these are these three bars, they're either green or red. So just try to make them all green. I mean, it sounds silly, but that's how it works. And this is normally how neurofeedback works. Not only this one, in general, how we train people with neurofeedback. Okay, Andy, how do you make a spot on a computer screen turn green? I mean, is it just thought process? You know, before I started all this, the idea of being able to control something using brain waves was like science fiction to me. But when we started, um, one of the first things we did for every session was to be able to control the volume of a piece of music, which I found amazing to begin with, just to, the fact that I could drop the volume and control it and, you know, hold it there. After that, I was looking at the screen and making the bars go from red to green. And at the very beginning, it was a kind of random thinking in different areas of your brain, if you like. Let me go back on this. I mean, this, this sounds a bit like Doctor Who. Obviously, you're connected up to some sort of machine. Oh, yeah. There's a, a cap on my head with electrons <laughs> attached to it. And as I say, by, by trying to think of different parts of the brain uh, to try to make the, the bars go from red to green. And then once I had hit on an area that seemed to work quite well, was to try and focus on that all the time and try and make the bars stay green. And that worked quite a lot of the times. I mean, there was quite a few sessions where it worked really well, the pain would go down. I think the times it didn't work was not anything to do with the science of it. It was more me not being able to concentrate or having had to rush here or, you know, something that didn't make me be able to focus as well as I could have. To me, the focusing part of it is probably similar to something like yoga, where you try and take your brain to a different place if you like. I mean, I've never done yoga so I don't know it exactly but it was to try and get to somewhere in your brain where you could almost control the pain and just bring the pain down and as I say it did work on several sessions, many sessions it did work. One of the side effects of it was it, it, it lasted for maybe two or three hours afterwards after we'd stopped the training and another side effect was um, there was a sensation of heat that came with it. 
which was really strange to me. My feet felt as if they were almost in fire sometime, but the pain had gone. Um, and that lasted two, three hours afterwards as well. So let me get this straight. When you're sitting in front of the computer screen and you, you have the electrodes attached to your head, did you have to consciously think pain go away and the pain did go away or were you thinking about other things? I tried to think of somewhere in the brain where there wasn't any pain. You know, it's almost a place where if you could go in your brain, pain wouldn't be there. And the result of that was the bars would go green and the pain would go down. It's a hard thing to describe, but I suppose it's different for everyone. You know, different individuals would concentrate in a different way and have different uh, technique. That worked for me. The only problem with it I, I found was at home, it's not so easy to concentrate like that for any length of time because there, there are distractions, you know, you, you think of something different and you're away. The brain's gone, you know, it's, it's a way off for a different tangent. So it's hard to use in a practical way, but it, it did work while I was here. There was no doubt about that. So is it akin to what many of us are told in pain management programmes, visualisation? I mean, I use visualisation when I'm having my blood pressure down. I take myself to an island, I think green thoughts, and that should bring my blood pressure down. Mm -hmm. That to me is visualisation. Is this the same sort of thing? No, I, I tried thinking of you know, on a beach on a sunny day, all these kind of things. That didn't work in this, this case. It was more a case of finding somewhere to concentrate within the brain, which ignored everything else, you know, which kept the pain at bay, if you like. It was a different technique. It wasn't the sunny beach, lovely day kind of thing. Did you develop the technique yourself or were you taught how to do it? No, Alex at the beginning said nothing. She wouldn't guide me at all. She said, you have to find what suits you. So it's a case of experimenting almost at the beginning just to find somewhere that works and then see if the, the pain reduces. You know, So it was uh, interesting at the first to see what worked and what didn't work. And the relaxing part of it didn't seem to work for me. It was more of focusing on a place and getting the pain to go away. So Alex, what do you tell people at the start of this programme? Well, I explain them what is it all about and I explain them that, okay, probably they know that pain is in their brain and they're try we are trying to change basically how brain works. But I don't give them many strategy maybe sometimes say okay try to relax because if you're very nervous nothing will work what people see on the screen is actually online uh, their, their brain activity from certain brain regions in real time so this is single blinded study in a sense they don't know which areas I'm choosing and sometimes on purpose I would go to the wrong side and wrong frequency just to check if it's placebo or if it's really that area. So I was amazed. Andy was here only two times when he said at the end of the session, listen, I think I was regulating these bars with this part of the brain. And the electrode was right there where he pointed. And it was really, really amazing for me. Okay, this is my study, but really sometimes I really get surprised that he was able to define where he thinks this control comes from. I find it absolutely incredible that you can pinpoint a part of your brain that is in use at the moment. I mean, you know, I have no idea which part of the brain I'm using. I can read books, possibly written by you, Alex, that'll tell me which parts of my brain, but I couldn't identify them. Yeah, that, that's hard. I tried on myself the same thing. Of course, I don't feel any relief of pain, but I can't exactly say which part of the brain, but I can feel that I'm in the right state of mind. Something like almost floating. I feel I can levitate, which I obviously not. And I don't know how yoga or relaxation really looks like. But this is my feeling when I'm trying to make these bars green. But from which part of the brain? It's still amazing for me. I mean, this is my research, but it still surprises me. <laughs> So Andy, when you could point to which part of the brain you thought was working, mm -hmm. can you explain that to me? 
How did you feel? It's just focusing on one side of the brain or the top of the brain. Imagining what is your right-hand side of your brain or the top of your brain and just seeing what happens on screen. You know, that is the feedback part of it, That's which feedback, is important. Right. And it's just a case of focusing and it's hard to describe, you know, just um, imagining maybe a part of your brain or a, even things like having a conversation, you know, recalling a conversation and concentrating on the right-hand side of the brain, for example, just to see what happened on screen and then gradually working out what was reducing the pain and trying to hold it there. So, Alex, the feedback side is that Andy himself is training his brain through the feedback from the screen mm -hmm. that you know what area is being involved. Right. And that feedback is going through to Andy and therefore he can identify. Yes. So I know exactly what I want to achieve. I know in which direction I want to move his brain waves. So I'm setting sort of a threshold which is slightly above or under his natural brain activity and I'm encouraging him to change it in direction either increase or decrease different frequency bands. It's all very well Andy saying that he feels better. Do you have any evidence that something's going on? Yes, certainly. We record his brain activity during training before and after each session and we recorded that over the period of 40 sessions. So now we can see, we can compare his brain activity when, when he came the first time and before his last training. So it's not training, it's just his uh, normal brain activity and we can see that his brain activity have shifted in the direction that we wanted, that we trained him. So this is an evidence, definitively, that something is going on. <laughs> Andy, are you optimistic that you can continue with this in the future? Well, I have been, I mean, since December when I stopped. When the pain peaks, I use the technique and I think it does take the edge off the pain. But as I say, long term, it's difficult to concentrate at home to sustain that level of uh, effort into the, the feedback part of it. If a handheld device or a portable device could be made, which you could switch on and do the same things that I've been doing in the hospital here, then that would be a big advance, I think, you know, just something practical like that. But the science part of it has been proved to me. Controlling the pain by using your brain, to me, does work. One of the things I think I also got out of the research is just that being in charge of the pain. You know, prior to this, the pain came and it was there and I couldn't do much about it. After the research, I felt I could control the pain. I was in control a bit more. And the pain doesn't always have to be in charge of you. You can push the pain back if you like. That was a benefit of it as well, just being in charge of the pain. I could envisage an application, an app for a mobile phone yeah. being developed for something like this. I've already suggested it. That's Andy Nisbet along with rehabilitation engineer Alexandra Vuktovic. Don't forget that you can still download all the previous editions of Airing Pain from painconcern.org.uk and you can obtain CD copies direct from Pain Concern. If you'd like to put a question to our panel of experts or just make a comment about these programmes, then please do so via our blog, message board, email, Facebook, Twitter or pen and paper. All the contact details are at Pain Concerns website. And finally, whilst the smartphone brain modulation app may be some way over the horizon, don't forget that mindfulness has been up and running without any glitches for nearly 3,000 years. You don't need any equipment, it's free. You don't need to be educated. Any of us have got access to these incredibly simple techniques that can transform our lives.